Welcome to the Twinkle Talks EYFS podcast. Working in the early years is busy, funny, messy and exhausting. Join me, Shana, and the rest of the Twinkle EYFS team as we talk honestly about our experiences as practitioners, teachers and professional nappy changers. Whether you're listening to increase your CPD hours or catching up on our antics whilst driving home from work, Twinkle EYFS will share everything you need to know about all things early years. Hello, wonderful listeners, and welcome to another episode of Twinkle Talks EYFS. Um, we've had some really good guests, haven't we, so far? Like, I'm so honored to be able to talk to these people and, like, just give them a platform so that you guys can learn some things as well. Today, we've got an amazing lady all the way from America. She's called Jill Diane Bittinger. And the way we met is I was able to go along to some of her webinars and she had a big, big summit and invited all of these amazing early years practitioners and specialists in to come and talk to people. And I was lucky enough to be able to come along. And I thought, wow, okay, this is pretty cool what you're doing, this summit. Would you mind coming on? Because I think you've got a really important message. And lucky for me, she said, yes, I know, look at me. But before we get there, let's have a little bit of fun today, shall we? It's time for another round with Katie of Only in the EYFS. This week in Only in the EYFS. Tell me you're short-staffed in early years without telling me you're short-staffed in early years. Kimberly Black reports a time when a child came out of the bathroom naked, shouting I've done a poo. On sports day, with no lunch cover... Two members of staff, one dealing with a nosebleed. What a day. Only in early years. In the middle of a punami, Jill Stacy was asked by the child, do you go to work? No, I'm sure she enjoys wiping bottoms in her spare time. We've had recent reports from Danny Hussein saying that a child in her setting has told her that she smells like her grandma's sock drawer. Now we're not here to judge Danny, but you know that old saying, out of the mouth of babes. That's it for this episode. Tune in next time for more antics in only in the EYFS. <laughs> oh dear. Do you know, I never get tired of this segment. The things that kids come up with, it, it's just hilarious, isn't it? And I think it's very unique to early years. I think we the children say some pretty special things. <laughs> now it's on to our main event with the lovely Jill Diane Bittinger all the way from Arizona. And she's here today to talk to me about overall the Montessori approach, which is what she uses and how it impacts her teaching style, but also about getting to the spirit of the child and what that means. So let's take it away, shall we? Miss Jill Diane Bittinger, all the way from Arizona. We are so honored to have you on our podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy to be here. So we have asked you to come on today because, again, the beauty of LinkedIn has just been amazing in terms of connections. And um, I was lucky enough to attend one of your early years summits, which was free, which I thought was also crazy. Um, and you introduced me to all these different amazing practitioners from across the world. And you have a lot to say as well most prominent for today's episode about aspects of the Montessori approach and something that you call the spirit of the child, which I'm so intrigued about. But before we get there, uh, could you please tell our wonderful listeners about yourself, um, about the work that you do, and also your relationship um, with the education sector? Oh, these are such great questions, and I'm really thrilled to be asked. <laughs> I care deeply about education and feel like that really is the way for transformation of our planet mm. at this time when there's so much intensity going on. There's lots of bad news, but there's also the good news of people awakening and realizing that, gosh, we really only have this one planet and we are going to have to figure it out as a world people. And so to get that global consciousness, education is the way. And my summit was called Empowering Educators and Unite Transforming Learning Environments Through Uniting Mind, Body, and Spirit. 
I was excited to bring in different educational leaders from all over, including many major names in Montessori. For instance, Gavin McCormick was one of our bonus speakers, and I just follow him and am so impressed with what a global vision that he has, Val Alino also. Then you brought in the world leaders that are paving the way through social and educational coherence in the classroom, Jenna Moniz, and so many, and integrating nature. So these were just such a privilege to get to talk to so many educational leaders and emphasize the difference that we can make when we understand it's a whole child that we're dealing with. We are not just trying to teach the mind alone and that we're dealing with a whole educator also who has a passion for the work or not, who is being fed or not. And these ideas have developed for me personally over my own educational journey. I do believe very firmly that we are best when we're our lifelong learners. Being a lifelong learner reminds us that, like, how are my relationships feeding my world? How are not just my knowledge, but how is that knowledge turned to wisdom? And the wisdom turns to, it turns to wisdom through experiences. Then you really live it. And so I think that the education needs to be that aspect of living it. The way it's looked for me is I started with a BA in psychology, worked with brain injured, and, you know, that was interesting, but I had always been dancer just for fun. And I was like, I've got to do the dance. And so... This is a fun fact I didn't know about you. What kind of dance? (laughs) I love dance and have always been one of those people dancing around the living room to express my feelings, you know? Oh, I love that. (laughs) And so I was um, dancing around the living room. I said, I've got to do something with this. And I got my master's from UCLA in dance education. And uh, then really incorporated that mind-body connection. So that was my starting place. And how it's fed into the spirit over all the years. I taught multicultural dance in New York for about 10 years. And then I came and was a teacher and got my Arizona teaching credential and found my way to Montessori. And when I got to really work with the children is when I feel like my spirit expanded to a whole new level. Of course, we're always integrating all three, but that soulful self got actualized in a new way. And I think that that awakening happened in part because children are so real, right? They're just so authentic and real with you. And as I learned about the significance of the year year, zero to age seven time slot, that really we're being formed for who we are the rest of our lives in those essential significant time very significant then i i became more much more passionate about education and then that's fed into starting my own business still being a teacher i'm an elementary teacher also and also owner and founder of transformed education and author of the book teaching with the soul in mind and peace education, our time is now. And um, starting a YouTube channel, Education Answers. Oh, how exciting! Oh, that will be really fun. Yes. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm still like trying to figure out how to be out there in the world. It's very, very small. So I invite your listeners to come on over. The video on YouTube is teaching with the soul in mind and. You can find my channel that way. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. We'll definitely pop that in the description as well so people can can go and see your work because, um, I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it, Jill? Like, <laughs> I found amazing people like you and other people through your summit. And it's just, you know, building that global community. So 100%. Exactly. And realizing there's so much more similarity than there are differences. That's what strikes me again and again. That Absolutely. There is this inner thing happening for so many of us prompting us to explore and develop ourselves in new ways that are feeding into this global movement of awakening is what I really call it. Yeah, no, I love it as well. And I think, I think especially over perhaps, I don't know how you feel maybe about, you know, the past couple of years, especially with the pandemic and things like that, it's kind of just fast tracked that movement of, you know, um, and almost brought it 
back the feeling of community and like you say spirit and and you know we're so lucky that we live in a in a world that has this amazing communication that even though we're eight hours apart we can have a chat about amazing things like this and we're just in such a privileged position that we can share with the world and I think a lot of people are are kind of tapping into that as well and being like hey we're in this together it's one world like you said let's let's band together and like you say especially with our young children imagine imagine what could happen so for those of us who don't know could you explain to our listeners what the Montessori approach is yes yes I I didn't mention that part very much in my history but it was significant as I became a teacher I started first with kindergarten and then discovered Montessori and um, there was just something so compelling that as I got to become a mother I really chose that time to also then study about Montessori, become certified in Montessori, so that when then I came back to teaching and my child was just a toddler, we both got to start at the same school where I stayed for 10 years, then went to Mexico and worked at a Montessori school there. But that has expanded the community for me of holistic educators that understand the importance. And speaking to the spirit of the child is actually you know, um, a very well-known concept in the Montessori editions. I believe that she has a book, The Spirit of the Child, and she has oodles of books. If you want to read more about her work, there's also all kinds of books about her. She lived over a hundred years ago, and the influence from Maria Montessori, who was, I think, the first woman to ever get a doctorate, in Italy, Pia ended up focusing on young children and teaching the world the profound difference that educating the young child with intention can make for the rest of their lives and for the readiness in school and that they're so much more capable than we realize. So Mm -hmm. it's really fundamentally about empowerment from within coming out like a blossoming flower versus an overlay. Be quiet, look up straight ahead, do the worksheet. You know, I told you not to talk, right? That was the old model, like children should be seen and not heard. Now they're like, what do you have to say? Let's discover, let's explore. And this fundamental shift has so much to do with Marie Montessori's pioneering work. That was beautiful. I was just trying to think in terms of your settings then, whether you were, you know, um, where you were in Arizona with your wonderful toddler, which is beautiful, by the way, that you were able to be in the same school as, as your children. That's lovely. Um, or in Mexico, what, 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 what did Montessori look like in the classroom then? Okay, so there's some fundamental themes about that. And um, I just want to have my list here so I can refer to it because there's a lot yeah, of, of unique um, aspects that make a Montessori classroom a Montessori one. First of all, it's working from the belief that every child has unique talents and interests within and school should be there to help the child draw out those talents and find their interests And part of the way that happens is through allowing choice. So it's very much about a prepared environment, which is not overbearing with a lot of bright colors, but it's about natural. There's using a lot of wood and and natural things, cloths and things that keep it very um, welcoming and warm, not an overlay of, of decorations up to the ceiling and posters and things like that. It's about maybe a beautiful piece of art, live plants that you care for, and many, many options of works that are available to the child. Those works are intentionally named as such, which are works, because the idea is that the child's work is as important to the child as the adult's work is to the adult. Absolutely. And you go and you get invested and invest yourself fully all day in different works of your choice that you work on as as long as you want within this three-hour period of focus. So you really are aiming for a three-hour period where you get to have your snack, you clean up within that time but of extended focus. It's about how can we cultivate the focus? So rather than just artificial, bring, ringing the bell, ringing the bell, ringing the bell, it's about allow the differences of 
child focus time, depending on the age, in terms of letting them choose their work, bring it to the table or to the rug. Lots of work happens on the floor, always within the capacity of the rug that you've rolled out to indicate this my space and focus to your heart's content. Of course, you know, there's still lunch times and everything like that, but focus deeply on that and then put it away correctly, a place for everything, everything in its place, very organized. And the way that that stays organized is that you choose a work after you've been given a lesson. So that lesson can come from a teacher or a guide is what they call the leaders in Montessori or from the assistant or from an older child. So there are age groups of three year spans, like primary is ages three to six. And that's where I first started my Montessori path. And then they group them six to nine. There also is increasing awareness of zero to three as an age group where many Montessori classrooms focus just on that toddler and infant realm. But these different planes of development each have within them their sensitive periods. And so as the child is at that sensitive period, let's say for writing, there's a natural urge, a natural desire to write. And so you'll have an easel so your movements can be big and start out with big movements that then come down to smaller and smaller articulation of the hands. And those muscles can be developed not just through put the pencil and trace these letters, but use a tweezer and take a pom-pom from one bowl to another. You know, use chopsticks with the child handy plastic thing that helps them out and connects them. And then, (laughs) you know, using a different kind of natural thing, maybe a bead to pick up those with. And so you're using your pincher grasp to transfer. And those kind of works are called practical life. So we want to learn how to use chopsticks. We want to learn um, how to maneuver our fine motor skills well. And those come through practical life. Starting out with a big movement like scrubbing a table always remembering, wipe it down. They go get their own water. They dump out the dirty water. They know where the clean rags are. Or if there's a bowl of peas and you pour them out onto the floor and then sweep them all into the middle square that's designated with tape, then from there you use the dustpan to sweep it up all the way. So many things, or cleaning windows using a squeegee, there's watering plants, there's also outdoor environment. So it's all about connecting to natural tasks in natural ways where the child is encouraged rather than sit down, I'll do that for you. Yes. It's a lot about empowerment of the child because it's so testified through evidence that the child is very capable of much more than we've realized. And especially when empowered to see that in one another and encouraged, like, oh, do you want to work on this together? You can work in partnership. Then they are learning so much from each other. It does not have to be a top-down model of teacher transmission to a blank slate. It's very much about activating what's within and trusting that inner spirit to want to express itself, to be ready to express itself and have the means to express itself and be curious rather than just dominating as an adult. Gosh, it's really interesting, actually, when you go into, you know, the detail of what it looks like in the classroom, because it's those things that you probably wouldn't think about, like, oh, you know, we're going to make a piece of art today uh, with the children. But no, no, I'll set up the paint. I'll set up the table. I'll do this, you know, because you're a teacher. That's what you, what you think you're expected to do. But actually, in the Montessori approach, you're in, you're involving the child in the entire process in the decision making well, actually, do they do they even want to paint at all? <laughs> what are we going to do today? Okay, well, they've decided they want to paint. What are they going to paint? What can we what can we expose them to to give them inspiration? Where do they draw their inspiration from? Okay, well, what do we need? Okay, well, you, how are you going to go and get that? 
you know and and like afterwards you know I, I'm definitely guilty of this as well you know sometimes it's just easier it's just easier just to clean up myself too. okay it's just easier okay I've got 30 odd kids like they're three years old and there's a mess I'm just gonna do it but the intent the purpose there like you say is actually those life skills are just as important if not more important than the actual task itself in a in, in a way you know there's so much learning going on that we take for granted and sometimes don't even let, allow the children to do actually and I, what you're pointing out about you know the management aspect is valid and a lot of adults feel that way because like i can't even imagine just letting them have that much choice that we're talking about Right? Like I've got to keep yeah. control in this classroom. <laughs> but part of that shift is from whole group learning to individualized learning. And so you you set out the tools slowly, you introduce them. The whole demonstration, the modeling is very important part of giving a lesson which allows them then to choose that work. So it begins with just establishing, if you're working on the floor, for example, then you're going to roll out a rug. And so that rug is supposed to be neatly rolled. You take your time, you pinch the edges, you roll, you check the edges as you're rolling it. The modeling has been slow about how to roll the rug. And then every time before you can go on to a new work, then you have to roll up that rug or clean up the work that has been at the table. And so this establishes a kind of slow methodology and orderliness from the beginning. How do you carry that tray? You carry it with the two hands, you bring it back to the same shelf place that it was. Mm. And that way you're not trying to organize, you know, 25, three-year-olders, which definitely you do need to have pre-cut things and all of that. If it's going to be that kind of whole group instruction, it's not... that it's never without whole group instruction. But the Montessori idea is that, okay, this child, let's say, is going to do art because he or she has chosen to go to the easel. Do you want to work with the watercolor paints? Here is the watercolor paint tray. You know you need to go over to the sink and get some fresh water. When you're done, you take that, that container over, you empty it out to the sink, you rinse it out, you put it back, and you put your paints back on the shelf where they were. Or do you want crayons? Here's where the crayons are. I'll get the crayons. And so it's working with that individuality from very young. And the other ways of doing that are about making sure that they are seeing it modeled from the older students within the classroom. As a younger student, you're seeing that demonstration. You're empowering the young ones. So ages three to six in in the U.S., we call that older grade kindergarten, they often get start to get pulled out into regular schools by the time kindergarten's coming in. There are increasing number of Montessori schools, but the idea is that by the time in an age group of three to six, that you are a leader in that particular age group. And even with the very young, let's say zero to three, if they're you know, noticing like, wow, Johnny is standing up and walking. I think I'm going to try that. Then there's that natural example that is being set by somebody that's so relevant to your age and stage that it catches your attention in a different way than, you know, just like, now stand up and, you know, like forcing walking. It, it, It motivates, it inspires. And how do we learn? motivation being inspired that's a big piece of it yeah it's amazing isn't it I feel like the even some aspects of um, techniques that you're talking about a lot of um, teachers in England are actually kind of incorporating those kind of styles anyway which is really affirming to hear you know especially about like you say the independence and the ownership and taking care of things and you know they are humans at the end of the day. So we should be treating them as such and they should be learning, like you say, practical life skills, um, not only for their academic benefits, but for for life benefits. They are going to have to use these skills later. So we, you know, we should be teaching them as well, which is amazing. And from what I um, know about you and have been following you, you, you know, you, you do your own work beyond the Montessori approach. So how does, how does the approach inform the work that you do with children? Well, I've gone up to older. I went to elementary 
in the Montessori. And so there's junior elementary, ages six to nine, and then senior elementary, nine to 12. I went up from primary up to elementary and uh, learned about cosmic education. That one is really interesting. It's about the idea of giving the big picture, you know, starting young with a understanding like we all live in the universe we all live in the milky way galaxy we all live in the solar system we all live on planet earth there's a song for this then oh. on what continent you live then on what state then on what you know city what school and it finishes with we all have inner energy and this inner energy is part of the way that you make manageable the classroom and so these key concepts that I've learned and cultivated in Montessori, I'm really interested in expanding them to um, larger circles of educators so that we can get these principles. One of them is that a lot of times in traditional classrooms, you, all right, now let's be quiet. Your Our voices get louder, right? Yeah. And especially the more that we want to control. Whereas if you cultivate self-control, then actually we find we really honestly like calm mm. and you can model a whisper voice. And if you don't want a, you know, quiet classroom, it's much more like a quiet beehive with buzzing and just doing their activity. But as we learn a quiet voice and we establish that quiet practice, then children honestly really want that calm. We we are wired to have a sense of calm. And so often, just in our society, we get adrenalized, right? Yes, constantly. Really, uh, like, gotta go, gotta do, gotta go, gotta do. And give children the gift of childhood. Like, let's explore, let's play, let's be. Because that's how they learn. And so one of the practices that you always start the day with is a circle sitting down on the ground, cross-legged. You stay pretty fit as a Montessori teacher because you're <laughs> down off the ground a lot. You know? <laughs> but that grounding, that sitting there in a circle, you know, knees to knees, is very strengthening to build the community. It's also grounding, especially as you close the circle with a very simple activity, just Let's take time to make silence and say, I cross my legs. I place my hands on my knees. I make my back very straight. I tell my body to be still. I tell my mouth to be silent. I take a deep breath. I close my eyes and feel my love. And it's quite amazing because you can really hold like a full minute of silence, even very young. And then you ring a, a Tibetan bell, something with a sweet chime. You really have to watch your sounds in the environment. Is you know, clang, clang, clang. No, no, none of that. No, it's bing. And you listen to the resonance. How long does it last? So then that's a calm energy. And so maybe dismissing them one by one where they're walking around the rug to remember that we, you know, never step on the rug. It's a place for our work. And then they go and choose a work and find that. And the snack is part of that. Like, are you, are you hungry? Go get your snack out, clean up after yourself. Here's the snack table, two can eat at a time, eat when you're hungry. Those kind of procedures that help to keep the calm classroom. And if the teacher is hearing it getting aloud, we like, quiet voice, use a quiet voice, you know, modeling it, whispering it. Mm. So, now I told you to be quiet. <laughs> no, it's like, no, yeah. like, you're really like coming up to that individual. Oh, are you using a quiet voice? Yeah. So it's very, very respectful, very gentle. Mm no matter what the age, about able to remember that we really want respect to all of us. And so how do we model that for our children? It's beautiful. It's really nice. I'm just imagining as you're saying all these wonderful things, like I can just, I can see it, I can visualize it. And, you know, in, in nurseries and baby rooms and, and, you know, and things like that. And what the question I kind of wanted to ask next was what drew you to this work and why, why is this approach to the child that, you know, looking at things holistically and looking at the whole child, why is it so important for their development? Do you think? Well, I got to, after I got my teaching credential, I did four months in Costa Rica oh, wow. at the 
Cloud Forest School up in Monte Verde. And there they were teaching bilingual strategies in order to be advocates of their own environment and understand the significance of the rainforest and how do we advocate for it. And so that's when I first got to see Montessori in action. And I was just so pleased like to feel the calm and like, oh, are you going to leave this workout till tomorrow? Then let's put your name on it. It's here on the rug. We're going, this is a big work. And so just honoring, like, we don't always have to like, okay, now clean it all up, clean it up. And I was, oh, wow. And then how there was a whole writing section and then the practical life section and then the math materials are like getting to see and touch. Honestly, it wasn't even Montessori till a Montessori school that I got to see like, oh, a square number is because it actually makes a square. Mm -hmm. Like, how did I miss that? Yeah. <laughs> a cubed number is actually a cube and you get to see and touch. Here's what a nine bar looks like. Here's nine nines that make a square. Here's nine by nine by nine that make a cube. You get to see and touch and feel. So I was very intrigued. And then, you know, that served as the motivation. And then the other piece that I wanted to say was also part of that experience was being there in the rainforest, like, okay, today we're going to go out and look for bugs. And just the time given to go look for bugs. And this is so important and how much partnership and community building was allowed child to child within that context, because often we want to be in teacher-centered classrooms, then it's about the child's relationship to the teacher, but not a lot of cultivating the child's relationship to other children. And the more that we can do that, then the more that there is going to be a natural peace. And one of the first examples I saw of this emphasis towards peace was there was some conflict happening and the teacher said, well, do you need to go to the peace table? And I was just like, wow. And they, so they did and they took their turns. It, I think it was a peace feather at that time. I use a peace rose right now, but we're talking stick. It can be anything that's special and sacred and they're on the table, you know? So it's that person's turn, then the other person's turn. And a big part of what I teach is about reflective listening before you can say your part, like, oh, you were sad because I didn't want to play with you at the playground. Well, I wanted to play with Joey. Yeah, but then I felt left out. And so it's it's feeling, taking turns, reflecting back what you're hearing and allowing each person to be having a voice. Whereas like in many, in many playgrounds, you do, go sit on time out on that bench. You go sit down on time out on that bench. It's just an overpowering. And again and again, we want to empower, not overpower. Oh, I think that's that's really succinct. I love that. Empower, not overpower. Yes, that's, <laughs> well, that's just the epitome of the whole process, isn't it? It's like, yeah, it's the whole child. It's the whole learning experience. It's just looking at everything as being important. And I think what really strikes me is the pace, because I think, especially over here in England, there's so much pressure to do you know uh, you need to do an hour of phonics a day you need to do an hour of writing a day you need to do an hour of history a day you need to do and there's just not enough time in the day Jill like there's a, so many expectations that you know we have to fill our timetable and there's so many things that we're expected to do but this flips it on its head and it's like actually let's take our time with this and I bet I can imagine you get so much more out of it because you're really taking the time to break down these processes to really explore and go deep into skills that are learned or um, topics that the children are curious about. And I bet from the outside, you know, from higher up, that they're, they're looking at numbers and they're looking at progress and speed and all of this and that. And actually, no, 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 no. The Montessori approach is about the child. The pace is for the child. And that is so how it should be. It's tricky, right? Because now there's this whole emphasis on the testing these days. And yes. so like, well, is it translating to high numbers on the test? And so, you know, there is that, that piece in the U S too, that like, how do we make sure they know how to take the test? How are we addressing the test issues? It's can be fundamentally different, but if you 
look at it. Like, what are some of the problems that we're having with our teens? Well, if you're overpowered and manipulated and, and really pushed in those younger years, you know, it doesn't matter if you like it, just do it, <laughs> you know? Like, where is the love? How do we cultivate the love for the self, where the love for each other, the love for the work, the love for life? If it's just been do it, do it, do it, and a sense of overpowering, then that in the teen years is when there's the pushback, the disenchantment. Well, now I'm big enough that you can't just, you know, boss me anymore. And so if instead we're like, what do you think? We need that leadership. And then in the teen years, we're cultivating them to be like, have a voice, have a lead and make a difference because we clearly need many differences made in the world, right? Yeah. How do we invite them rather than having so many problems that are so evident? Do you know, I think that's the key difference in approaches such as Montessori and others are like it. It's about the invitation. Whereas, you know, perhaps maybe more traditional, older um, approaches to teaching, it wasn't an invitation. It was a, you got, you've got to do this. This is what you need to do to get through education. This is what you need to do to get a good job. This is what you need to do to be happy. You know, all of that stuff. And I feel like from top down, there is still that expectation, you know, from, I don't know, governing bodies or even higher up than that. You know, there's this societal expectation that, all oh, right, you know, it's, almost like a factory in a way you know we're, we're putting children in boxes for an old framework that doesn't exist anymore and actually the Montessori approach and things like that is almost it's a clear message isn't it to to you know things like that that this is not the way anymore I don't think it ever was the way but you know look at look at the impact let's invite our children let's invite our future leaders into this conversation because like you say what's been happening so far is not working and will continue to to fail not only us but our children so we need to try something new and I hope that our listeners when they're listening to this this is not a oh you're going to find it really hard you're going to have pushback and all you know it's it's against the grain but keep at it I want this episode to be a message to our leaders and say this is approaches these approaches are from people on the ground, on the front line, as it were, who know children, who know the process, who know this system. Listen to us. Listen to our children. It's 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 the top that needs to change, you know. And it's it's tricky. It is tricky. But like you say, if we all um you know make these movements, you know, like you say, this awakening together. Imagine what the world is going to be like when our children are growing up in these incredible environments that holistically take care of them and my kind of final question to you on that was clearly from this conversation we can see how it impacts you know their children and and the development but there's got to be a wider impact what's the impact globally if these kind of approaches and and, and this kind of work continues i just love what you're saying shana really and i testify to that philosophy as well. And it does not have to be Montessori. Like you don't have to be Montessori trained to believe in the power and importance of the inner spirit yeah, of the yeah. child. And in fact, I mean, coming from England, Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson is, yeah. is one of my heroes. I love his message. And he's all about like empower creativity, personalized learning. The personalized pathways is, is a key piece of that, that we are not meant to be the cookie cutters, because we came here as soulful selves, you know, through this personality experience, through this particular journey of life to bring things as well as receive things. And what is it that is your work to do? You're going to have a natural bend towards that. You know, you'll love science or you'll love math or, or you're going to love gardening That's or you're going to love cooking, you know? <laughs> And those pieces are all part of what make us whole. And this is the key thing. We have got to understand education is for the whole individual and the whole educator, both child and teacher and all the helpers in between that we are best when we understand that there's this urge 
it's like um, the Greek word is entelechy. What makes an acorn turn into an oak? It is entelechy. There is something that is from within that is seeking to blossom, seeking to realize, seeking to become its fullest self. And it takes a lot of trust in being willing to step away from old models, necessitates a lot of communication in order to like, okay, what's working, what's not, that, you know, like, well, I've got to have this in place and I need some worksheets, you know, whatever it is that is your particular bent that is just for me to feel like I can handle this job. But just be in the investigation of it, the curiosity of, I wonder, and, you know, start to listen and learn about the messages that say, we don't just have to sit in chairs facing the front, listening to the teacher as she writes on the chalkboard. Those are old modalities. And we have come a long way. They used to, you know, slap your fingers with a ruling st ruler stick. So we are making progress. And just let's keep doing that. Yeah. And I think what's really pretty about it as well is while you were talking, it's just that realization that using the Montessori approach, it means that every setting is different. Because it's all about, you know, the unique child, which means that, yes, of course, they're all going to have the same approaches and, you know, core values. But the content, the things that the, all of the children will be doing in every setting is 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 going to be unique to, to that setting. And I think that brings a lot of, of freedom um, to practitioners as well, because, you know, at the moment it's you have to do this and everyone has to do this and you all have to be good at this and you have to get a certain percentage of children at this. And it's actually, well, no, hang on, that's not true to life. I've got a child who's incredible at this, so I'm going to help them do that. And, you know, there's a child who's got a gift here, so we're going to cultivate that one. And, you know, of course, it doesn't mean that we're going to, oh, okay, they're not, they're not great at this skill, we're going to leave that. Of course, that's not what it means, but it just means in terms of how we get to grow our children is also about us as well. And that's really lovely because if everyone has the same experiences, life would be very boring. Um, and I mm -hmm. think Montessori is a really lovely way to show, like you say, the similarities between us actually, but also if we're different, that's great. That's what we need. We need different. We need people who are skilled in different things, et cetera, et cetera. And we can cultivate different people um, in different ways as well. I just think that's a nicer, rounder world. <laughs> <laughs> right? We don't want to all just be auto engineers or whatever, you know? Right. Like, like we've right. got the variety is the spice of life. That's it. That's it. That's it. You're coming up with some really good one-liners. I feel like I need to write these down. <laughs> <laughs> We're really quite blessed as well because we have had some questions from our listeners uh, who are just really interested in the Montessori approach and also the work that you do. So one of our first questions is, is there a noticeable difference between school starters who have come from a Montessori background to those that haven't? Absolutely. Um, there's an engagement level that's very much wanting to be activated and invigorated through the school setting. There's also a desire for more independence, you know, which could be challenging to some teachers, but there's ability to trust their own thought. This is interesting to me, like, let me pursue it versus having to, you know, just sit down and I don't know, be spoon fed. It's about wanting to investigate and finding it for its finding out the connections, being involved in that process. There's also just a tremendous amount of um, maturity. Honestly, if that if that child has been watching a lot of animation and things, yes, there's some good lessons that come through the young pro people's programming. Or, you know, there's a lot of great child care centers that just allow a lot of play. Here's the blocks, here's the Legos, you know, and, and allowing that play and exploration is at least working with the spirit of the child and inviting that uh, as self-expression to come out. But one of the things that's really noticeable is like getting to play and touch with basically base 10 blocks, you know, so you have one tiny cube up on top and the big base cube on the bottom. That's the pink tower, which is a fundamental piece of a Montessori classroom or with round stairs. Feeling that difference as you move and build those from the big 10 to the one. And so there's an um, ability to relate and connect that has come through the use of the materials 
building the different kind of uh, triangle puzzles, understanding already they're like obtuse, scalene, uh, you know, working with geometric shapes be through touching them, feeling them, getting to identify and know geometric solids from very young. Oh, this is a cube. This is a sphere. Let's look how that sphere is different from a, from a circle. And it's all through sensorial learning. So when we involve our senses, there is an awakening of the mind that takes place. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I think this is a really good question as well, because um, not only do we have educators who listen to our podcast, we, we have parents as well. Um, and one of them has asked, what can parents do um, to continue the Montessori approach outside of settings? Help your child keep the environment in an organized way. Have it be child friendly. Make sure there's shelves in a child's room at the desk or the table should be child size. There should be materials that the child gets to touch in the kitchen. Here's the area for you to get the pans and be helpful for the pans. Or do you want to help me break the egg? Do you want to help me stir the egg into the flour mixture? Like finding opportunities to participate rather than like, no, 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 I have this. Like, okay, invite. And yes, it takes a little more patience. Yes, maybe it's sloppy sometimes, but beyond the sand, move them into real life opportunities to cook and mix and things like that, where of course it's monitored in the real kitchen, but the, or that here's your play kitchen that is as important to you as my big kitchen is to me. And I understand, you know, like the need to take it seriously. I don't trivialize it with my words. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. I just imagined like just little children just cooking alongside their mums and dads and their families. Oh, I love it. Yeah. And that's really good because <laughs> it's almost, you know, like you say, they, you teach practical life in school. So there's the opportunity to keep practicing those skills at home because home is practical life, isn't it? Like you say, helping do dinner or, you know, help your big sisters and brothers and and siblings with doing the washing up or um you know washing your clothes or washing the car yeah loads of things that they could do which is lovely and maybe it's more like puzzles that are really interesting for that that child you know like okay let's feed the curiosity let's go get those puzzles like which puzzle do you want now what do you want on your shelves now let's go to the closet and change out the materials yeah i like that um, yeah, and we've got one uh, last question, which is, I think, something really important to consider. What are the things for reception teachers to consider when receiving new starters from Montessori? I think even mainstream teachers are awakening to the necessity to nurture the inner spirit. So it's it's really about being willing to ask more questions than just always tell you how to be tell you what to do. You know, just because you're the biggest adult in the room doesn't mean you get to be the biggest boss. Like, yes, you are the director. You're the facilitator of energy. You are the knowledgeable one in terms of the ways of the world, but it doesn't mean you get to just be, you know, the big boss all the time. It's like, how do you get curious? What what is this child needing? Why are they acting out in this particular way? If we understand like there's an unmet need, well, I need to be seen and I wasn't being seen. So, you know, throwing a fit because that'll at least make me be seen. Like if we can see them, what's doing right. I just love the way that you're crossing your legs and feeling, being so ready, You know, noticing the positive things where they can feel seen and making those kind of positive differences, it's really about just enjoying them, fundamentally loving and understanding the importance of the work that you're doing. And that just like a plant that we plant in the garden, you can't rush it. There is a natural timing. I cannot force that flower to bloom until it's ready to bloom. And in the meantime, I'm just going to nurture it and provide the right environment. And so I'll make sure it has the water and the sun. And when it blooms, it blooms. I'm going to trust that there's a blooming process happening in its own time and not get my frustration on top. Why will that flower not bloom? You know, (laughs) (laughs) you know, it's really nice that analogy you know what it reminds me of I can't remember it must be a quote from something that I saw but it was you know if your flower doesn't grow you don't change the flower you change the environment yeah. and I think that's kind of like a nice way of you know looking at you know just because say for example you know a child comes from a Montessori setting and, and you're not 
that's okay. As teachers, as early as practitioners, we have to adapt anyway. And what what can they bring? What can they bring to to, to your, their new setting that's really going to benefit everybody? Like you say, children are not blank slates. They are not blank slates. They come with so much that they can offer the world. You know, having that... Um, I'm always really an advocate for having that um, communication between settings, you know, and and linking up with preschools, linking up with maybe the year above and, you know, having those conversations and, and learning from each other. I think that is probably a really nice way to do that as well. It's, you know, well, if you're not sure why a child is behaving this way from, I don't know, you know, a- any setting it doesn't need to be Montessori go and collaborate with with the preschools you know um, go and have a go and have a day together where you get to share learning you get to share spaces and I know that's not always possible and it, you know it is quite tricky but you know if there is a way that we can expand and and make a an early years community with different settings I think that would be beneficial for, for everyone yes and the thing that you're also speaking about is communication and when we have the communication you know just to acknowledge like I'm frustrated or I'm tired. I don't understand that even for the difficult stuff that we can at least process it through rather than getting stuck. So making sure that we're kind to ourselves, nurturing ourselves in the same process and just going like this area is really confusing for me. I think I need to talk about it to somebody, you know, and just sharing can be a big piece of figuring it out. Thank you so much, Jill. Oh, it's been lovely talking about this. Um, what we do at the end of every episode is we like to play a little fun game just to uh, end the note on a high, as we say. Um, it's called Would You Rather Teacher Edition? So there's some hard hitting questions, especially in Arizona style, I feel like we've got today. In honor of you, we've got some <laughs> Arizona style questions. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? All right, I'm listening. <laughs> teacher Edition, Would You Rather? Round one. Would you rather tea or coffee? Coffee with sweet cream. Oh, that's an easy one. Oh, there you go. Any particular flavors or? Um, no, just good cream. It's got to be Ooh. good cream. Nice, nice. I like that. I like that. I have no one yet that has said neither. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for someone to say, no, Charlotte, neither. Hot drink, gross. But it's not happened yet. It's not happened yet, Jill. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> um, okay, this is a really good one. Round number two. Would you rather have playground duty in 115 degrees Fahrenheit, listeners, that's about 45 degrees Celsius in our terms, or facilitate the peace table, as you so call it? Mm. I have to admit, I'd love to facilitate the peace table. I love getting to be part of children working out their issues by talking with each other. Oh, see, when I imagine the peace table, it doesn't really go down well. (laughs) If I'm there, just be lots of three years going, no, it's my toy. No, it's my toy. No, it's my turn. I just, I don't know. But then again, that heat, Jill, I think I would take anything over that heat. Well, what's so interesting is about, you know, playground issues are, playground dynamics are a time when children are really working out their interpersonal issues. You know, learning to play together is so big and that's going to affect, you know, your social life on up. And so like, how do we play together? How do we help resolve those? Well, the playground duty gets a whole lot easier once they understand how to communicate with each other. And so that facilitating the peace table, like just noticing it can just, wow, you're upset, you know? Yeah, because I, you know, and I, oh, wow. What do you hear? What is she upset about? Well, she's upset because I didn't play with her. And like, oh, but I didn't want to play. I wanted to play. Oh, do you hear her? And so it just like hearing and validating. There is so much power in those simple processes of like, wow. Yeah, I can see. You have strong feelings about that. I do. <laughs> oh, and, and then, and then you know, just allowing the emoting, allowing it. You don't yeah. have to fix it. You don't have to touch them. It's better if they're emoting and then touch them later. Can I give you a hug now? 
Uh, but a lot of times we want to put, oh, it's okay, or stop crying. Oh, gosh, that really affected you. Got real strong feelings. Just simple validation of that. And third, but finally, round three, would you rather in the Montessori approach teach practical life or maths? Oh, interesting. Math. I love the the math tools. And they're so good. Even If you're not a Montessori teacher, there's still such great ones. Just to understand, you know, what a square is and the difference between a, a unit and a tens bar and a hundred square and a thousand cube. I mean, already ages three to six, they're building numbers into the thousands and adding with dynamic addition and you know, there's there when you're touching and building the numbers, or for example, one of the big works with those early years is a, called a 45 layout. So you have the numerals, you lay out one through nine with a single with the beads, and then you have the ten bars, and you lay out ten through ninety, and you have the you know up to nine ten bars. Then you have the hundred squares, and you lay out one to nine hundred, one hundred to nine hundred. And then 1,000 to 9,000, and it's this big work, and like, wow, yeah, that's feeling the difference. You're still only counting one to nine. Once they can count one to nine, then they can do the 45 layout, and then it just brings it into like, oh, and there's families of, you know, the ones, the tens, the hundreds, tens, hundreds, and then the 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and it really like, okay, gosh, yeah. it starts to build relationship. Wow, that's crazy, because when you said that, I didn't actually, I've been a lovely teacher for 10 years, and I didn't clock. Of course, if your children know one to nine, they can, they can do any place value. They can. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Yeah. And the tactile piece is huge for those early years. Like you can see and feel like a thousand is this big block. Right. Which is often really tricky for children to grasp because it's such a big number. But by doing that. Just dealing digits. Well, oh, you know, then when you get into the place value exchanges in the later years, then it's really like, oh, wait a minute. You know, it can be very confusing if it's only just looking at digits. But when you understand that what those digits represent, it's a different thing. Oh, I love that. You've almost swayed me to maths. You've almost. But see, I'm a practical life girl. <laughs> I love those things. I love the teaching of even just simple things, you know, like preparing food or if there's, like you say, there's, there's things in the garden and, you know, how to look after things and even just simple things like, I don't know, folding clothes and I, I like those processes. I like teaching them how to, you know, do those things independently and the look on their face when they, they feel so grown up, don't they? And, you know, it's like, oh, yes, well, I tidied the table and I did it all by myself and, and I did this and I prepared it for the next group and nobody told me how to do it. And it was just, you know, it's all those things that I really, I really enjoy watching them, them flourish in. I can. The, I can. Yeah. And you think about just like a carrot, right? So it, if you want to peel that carrot, that's doable from a young child. And then they have those little um, rigid cutters that you can just like push it down and, and cut the carrot. And then you even interweave grace and courtesy, like grace and courtesy is part of it. Oh, now you may take this plate of cut carrots around and you'll, would you like a carrot? Oh yes, please. And modeling that. And so then just serving others already at that young age. It's just <laughs> magical, I love it. Jill, this has been such a lovely chat. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, we've learned so much in this episode already, which is great. Um, but if our listeners want to learn more about you, uh, learn more about the work that you do, where where can we find you? Transformed Education is my website and my business. And uh, it has the links to my, my other things there. Or LinkedIn, I'm going to give you the channel for that. I've started a Transformed Education page there. Uh, Jill Diane Biddinger on LinkedIn and Facebook. I have a page there, Instagram at Jill Diane. But Transformed Education is uh, the one where I'm trying to work my ideas into the bigger thing. And I just want to say, that, Shana, thank you so much for your support, your enthusiasm, the work that you're doing in the world. I love how you're empowering educators through the Twinkle Vision and Aww. just really helping unite you know, the commu global community. You're doing oh, a wonderful service. Stop, you're making me blush. Stop, stop. <laughs> but it's what it's about, isn't it? I just, you know, it's just that that feel. It's I've been in the job long enough. I know what it's like. You know what it's like. So let's bring people together and help 
and help other educators and help our future, right? It's just, there's just so much love. There's just so much love in the earliest community. Let's make it global, like you say. <laughs> Indeed, it's true. There we are. Amazing. Right. Well, Jill, you've got a jam-packed day ahead of you. Um, listeners, there's an eight-hour difference. So Jill has been so kind enough as to get on <laughs> on our recording studio at 7 a.m. her time. I feel awful. She's been incredible and she looks amazing. She's ready for the day. Um, but thank you so much, Jill, and have a wonderful day. And I look forward to seeing all of the things that you get to do next. Indeed. Thank you. And I look forward to staying abreast of your wonderful endeavors. It's so much fun to be part of it. Oh, wasn't that such a nice chat with Jill? She's so lovely. It was a really nice chat to have with her today. Um, what did you think? Get in contact. Do some of you use the Montessori approach already? Are some of you interested in using it? Are some of you not using it for a specific reason? Are you using other approaches that you feel suit your children more? Let us know. This is an open conversation. We love hearing about different approaches. The beauty of early years means there is no right approach, you know? So I look forward to hearing about you. Just before we go, though, I feel like I've forgotten to mention this. Did you know that the podcast is actually also on YouTube and it's got subtitles? So if that's how you prefer to listen, I know when I watch Netflix, I have to have the subtitles on because I just can't hear it without them. Don't ask me why, it's a thing. But if you are like me, go and head over to our Twinkle EYFS YouTube channel and you can find our playlist of Twinkle Talks EYFS episodes there with subtitles as well. I know. But for now, that is the end of the episode. And we've got a really, really exciting couple of episodes coming up. So keep up to date. Keep following us on social media. And I will see you next time. So that's it from today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. And I hope you really enjoyed it. If you would like to get involved or would like to know more, come and find us on our social media sites. We have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest and TikTok account. All of the details will be in the description. And whatever you're doing, I hope you have a great day today.